Good morning, everybody, and welcome into another episode of Hog Hoops Live. I'm your host, Curtis Wilkerson. You can find me with the squad, Trey Biddy, Danny West, and Andrew Ellis over at hogsports.com. The Razorbacks just keep finding a way. Kind of stole one last night from LSU. It was a nail biter, but another big win for Arkansas. We're going to dive into that one. We're going to get you primed for a weekend showdown with Tennessee that has a lot of stake in the SEC standings. We're going to dive into some more bracketology because Selection Sunday is just over a week away. Of course, we'll get to your questions, all that and more coming your way today on Hog Hoops Live. All right, quick reminder as always of the different ways that you can watch and listen. You can join us on Facebook Live. Be sure to give us a follow there. Uh, also available on YouTube. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube page. Remember, Hog Hoops Live has its own separate YouTube channel. For you podcast listeners, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it, the podcast will be right there where you find Hog Sports Live with Trey Biddy every week. Let's get into it. I mean, <laughs> what, what a way to cap a great season at Bud Walton Arena. 17-1 and one on the year in Fayetteville. And, and when you look back at it, really, from start to finish, I mean, there were some dandies, right? I, I remember the opener against Mercer. It seems like years ago. But, you know, Arkansas was actually down in that game with under 10 minutes to play. They went on that big 18-3 to run late to put the Bears away. I mean, it was a lesser team, but it was an exciting game right out of the gates. You remember that Northern Iowa game? Which, shout out to Northern Iowa, by the way, they won the Missouri Valley Conference regular season title. That's a tough league. I mean, they outlasted Loyola Chicago. We know all about Sister Jean and that team. Northern Iowa won that league. We'll see if they win their conference tournament. But, you know, those guys came into Bud Walton Arena and hit 17 threes. But Arkansas overcame it. That was the Chris Likes game. I think he had 26, 28 points in that one. You had that wacky loss that, to Vanderbilt, which still blows my mind that the Commodores are the only team to come in and win at Bud Walton Arena. Arkansas was such a different team then, but that game was wild. I mean, Arkansas was down, what, 6-7 in the final minute. Uh, they rallied there late. Note had the chance to win it at the buzzer on the sideline inbounds play. He missed it. The Arkansas thumped Missouri to start that the run that they're still on at this point. Had the crazy overtime win against Texas A&M. The SEC Big 12 Challenge dub against West Virginia. And the recent ones. I mean, the incredible overtime finish. The court storm after beating Auburn. The red the red out. It was, you know, that grinder defensive struggle against Tennessee. Last weekend was a madhouse. Arkansas outlast Kentucky. So many incredible memories this year. Uh, you know, after fans didn't get to fully experience it, and the team didn't get to fully experience it a season ago, with that special Elite Eight run, uh, just incredible. It really was. And listen, last night was no exception. Bud Walton was rowdy again. You know, Will Wade, he was complaining from start to finish. and But every time he stomped his foot or he started waving his arms around like one of those inflatables that you see at the used car lots, right? The crowd let him have it. It was awesone. Yeah, Arkansas wins that game 77 to 76. I got to be honest with you folks, most of the night to me, uh, this felt like one of those games Arkansas was setting itself up to lose. It, it kind of felt like a letdown. I mean, think about it. JD Note went nearly 30 minutes between baskets. When's the last time that happened? Jalen Williams fouls out with a little under five minutes to play. You know, the hog killer, Darius Days, is having a big game uh, amongst some other guys. Tari Eason had a big one as well. You know, Arkansas is kind of getting crushed on the glass there. It was reminiscent of, if you remember, Musselman's first team. Obviously, that was a small group. They had Adriel Bailey uh, kind of running the small ball center. But you remember when they played LSU and just got destroyed on the glass. And they battled, but they lost a close game. Uh, and I was kind of getting flashbacks of that, the way LSU was dominating glass, especially the offensive boards. But Arkansas finds a way. That's just what they do. I'm not even entirely sure how it happened. You know, I, I write a, a five takeaway story after a lot of these games, and I basically had to scrap it 
full disclosure at the end of the game and rewrite it afterwards because most of my takeaways were, you know, these are the reasons why Arkansas lost <laughs> just based on the way things were kind of going and shaping up. Uh, but they found a way and they won. And it, it's interesting, you know, it was similar to the first matchup against LSU. If, if you recall, you know, Arkansas was down in Baton Rouge by eight with nine minutes to go. Uh, and they closed that game on a huge run. They made the winning plays down the stretch. Last night, Arkansas is down seven with just over six minutes to play. They scrapped. They clawed. It wasn't pretty. Doesn't matter. They got it done. I mean, it was a wild final sequence. So, so much happened in the last three minutes of that game. But, uh, you know, Arkansas, they're down four, actually under two minutes to play at that time. You know, Aldis Tony, who's so clutch at the free throw line, by the way, I, I think he needs to be commended for that. It's a guy that shot mid-60s, upper-60s percentage-wise his entire career at Pitt. Uh, but he's nails at the free throw line for Arkansas. Uh, but he steps up, he knocks down a couple big free throws, then Note finds him underneath for a basket, ties the game at 74, the place is going nuts. Xavier Pinson, who, who's a hog killer in his own right, uh, immediately answers with a go-ahead basket for LSU, and it, it kind of sucked a little bit of the air out. Uh, you know, Arkansas comes back down. Stanley Amude, who was red hot, he misses a three, but, but Kamani Johnson, uh, of all guys, who he's in for Jalen Williams, who fouled out. You know, he gets tangled up with the LSU player there going for the offensive board. Uh, they wind up calling a hook and hold, the second one that was called during the game, uh, which I think was the right call. And, look, you know, Kamani goes up there, and he he makes the first, he misses the second at the free throw line. Uh, so you're down one, but you get the ball because of the tech. That was a huge swing, a momentum shifter there in that moment. Even though he didn't make both the free throws, uh, he, hey, he cut the lead, uh, the deficit from two to one, and Arkansas got the ball back. So you feel good about where they're at. And then they inbound it. J.D. Note slips, turns it over, and, and you're ripping your hair out because – you know, he kind of struggled all, all night because LSU was harassing him the full length of the floor. They'd face guard him. They'd trap him. They'd double him. Uh, they made life difficult on J.D. Note. That, that was the game plan, clearly. Uh, you have that turnover there. Not a great look, but Arkansas gets a defensive stop. The calling card of the year, right? Getting stops. Note gets the board. He's weaving through traffic in transition, and he gets fouled. With 8.6 seconds left, which I cannot believe that they fouled him there. Uh, I mean, you know, be aggressive defensively or whatever. They kind of had him in a in a little bit of a no man's land where he was on the floor, but fouled him. And you got a guy who struggled throughout the course of the game, but he's your leader. There's nobody else you want at the line at that point than J.D. Note. He goes up there, ice water in his veins. He sinks the go-ahead free throws. Arkansas has got to get one more stop. They did a great job of forcing Pinson to his left on the final drive. He misses the layup. Hogs win. I mean, it was incredible. What a game. And listen, both teams played so hard. I mean, they got after it. That was a that was a tournament-style game. And I, I want to credit LSU now because it's going to sound like I'm crapping on them in a minute, and I'm not. Uh, but they're good. I mean, this this is a, a five, six seed type team in the NCAA tournament that can 100% knock off a higher seed and, and get to the second weekend. They're good. They defend. They've got some talented guys. Uh, you know, for Arkansas to sweep LSU this season, whether the net rankings agree with it or not, and, and we'll talk about that in a minute, that's a big deal. It really is. You know, a few other takeaways before we move on from this game to what lies ahead. And we talked about the boards a little bit. I mean, Arkansas gave up 22 offensive rebounds. Um, that's not ideal. <laughs> it's semi-concerning, but, you know, Arkansas was plus 10 against the same team in Baton Rouge earlier in the year. Uh, they've rebounded pretty well all season, aside from, you know, the craziness that Oscar Shibwe put up last weekend. That guy gets 20 rebounds on everybody, right? Uh, so yeah, I think Arkansas is a, a good enough rebounding team to where I wouldn't be overly concerned about it, but it does raise an eyebrow. 22 is a lot. Uh, Arkansas does struggle with length. 
inside at times. Athletic length is, is I think, something that gives them a little bit of trouble. So that's something to keep an eye on maybe as we get into the tournament uh, when it comes to matchups and opponents. But whatever. Uh, how did Arkansas overcome it? Well, I think they did a really good job with ball security. And the, they had some, you know, turnovers that kind of made you wince at times, especially in the first half. It was a little bit sloppy. Uh, but listen, LSU leads the SEC and, and nearly the country in steals and turnover rate. They force 18 turnovers a game. Uh, Arkansas kept it down to a dozen, which is good. And then they took advantage of LSU's aggressiveness, trying to come up with steals, getting in you, trapping you. And they got to the free throw line 28 times. So winning those battles is how you overcome the offensive rebounds. Of, I think it was a 21 to 11 deficit in second chance points. That's how they were able to do it. I think LSU took 16 or 18 total shots more than Arkansas did, but Arkansas deed up. They limited LSU to 36% shooting from the field. Arkansas shot a pretty solid 44%. That's the number five defense in the country. Uh, according to Ken Palm, LSU, Arkansas shot well against them, and they got to the free throw line, and they won the game. Stanley Amude was terrific. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about how good he's been on the road. And, you know, Arkansas really got road Stanley at home in, in his Bud Walton finale, right? He saved his best home performance for last, 23 points. You know, he hit three really big threes. Uh, he had three really big dunks. Uh, he, I mean, he was terrific all the way around. He's getting so comfortable, and he's doing it in big games in key moments. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, Stanley Amude is the type of guy that can get red hot and win Arkansas an NCAA tournament game when when maybe other guys don't have their A game. And you kind of saw that last night because Note struggled a little bit. Jay Wills fouled out at the end of the game. You still like where you're at because of the way Amude is playing right now. Um, and he's backing it up by the way he's improved so much on the defensive end. So he's a huge key uh, for this team moving forward. Jalen Williams had another big double-double, you know, 19 and 10, three more charges. I thought he the best he has all season back to the basket. I mean, Arkansas is really feeding it in there to him on the block and the post, and he was going to work down there and scoring it or getting to the free throw line. He looked really good. I thought he struggled late defensively when LSU went small, and he was kind of stuck on an island at times, whether he was guarding Tari Eason or some of those other guys who are a little bit more mobile that contributed to some of the foul trouble there there was you know there was one uh, where I mean he's just straight up defensively and the guy's just backing it down into his chest he I thought he got a tough foul called on him there uh, you know had one block charge call that didn't go his way but he did get three charges too so you can't be too mad about that but uh, you know Arkansas's battled through foul trouble with note before but Williams he's just uh Man, he's just the glue or, or, you know, the straw that stirs the drink, whatever cliche you want to use. But when he went out, you know, with four and a half to go, I, I'm kind of wondering, man, like Arkansas is already struggling on the boards here. And, you know, he kind of makes everything go and flow on the offensive end of the floor as well. I don't like where this is headed. But, again, I mean, his team just finds a way. And speaking of J.D., you know, like I said, LSU, their game plan, I think, was clearly to limit him. They, they kind of threw the kitchen sink at him. Uh, he struggled for long stretches as a scorer. He, he had a three in the first minute of the game, didn't score again until there were 10 minutes remaining. So they did a nice job on him. I mean, he took some tough ones. He had some rough turnovers, kind of uncharacteristic turnovers. Uh, he got his pocket picked in the backcourt one time. He had that slip uh, turnover there late in the game. So he, he gets in trouble sometimes trying to do too much, but he had a couple uncharacteristic ones there. But listen, he made some key plays on both ends down the stretch. He had three of his five assists in the last couple minutes, uh, played great defense throughout the course of the game, and he hit those free throws at the end uh, to seal it. Audis Tony, uh, you know, I thought he really busted out. That was good to see. You know, this is a guy who is so efficient earlier in the year, but he's been struggling lately just to finish around the rim. But he had 18 points, uh, 6 of 9 from the field. I think he was either 6 of 7 or 6 of 8 around the basket. He, I think he took 1-3, uh, 6 of 6 from the free throw line. Kind of looked like himself again. He was relentless. I mean, his basket cuts, 
uh, attacking the glass, getting out in transition. That's the Aldi's Tony uh, that can really make an impact from this team on the offensive end. Now, defensively, he's been great, even while he's been slumping a little bit as a scorer. Uh, I thought one of the the key moves of the game really was Arkansas moving Aldi's Tony over to Xavier Pinson. Once that happened, and, and Tony guarded him pretty much exclusively in the second half. Pinson was only one of ten from the floor. Now, he had ten points in the first half, and it looked like he was going to burn the hogs like he has in the past, but he was one of ten in the second half. Uh, Pinson finished five of 21 from the floor, and a lot of that was because you put a six six guy uh, who's got good lateral movement and Tony on him uh, to harass him a little bit. And they got him in some foul trouble and, and things as well, but I thought that was a savvy move by Muss. And I mean, most importantly, Arkansas improves to twenty-four and six overall. Twenty-four and six. They were ten and five <laughs> at one point. Thirteen and four in SEC play. They were zero and three. Quite a turnaround, and and I mean, what it means at the end of the day is the stage is set uh, for a final weekend in league play that's going to be very, very important. Uh, Arkansas still has a chance to win the regular season SEC title. It would have been a better chance if Mississippi State wouldn't have crumbled in overtime uh, and, and taken down Auburn last night. They didn't, but you still got a lot to play for on Saturday. So right now, Auburn has a one-game lead in the standings. Again, they snuck out of Starkville with a dub last night. But then you got Arkansas, Tennessee, and Kentucky who are all one game back with one game to play. So Arkansas can win the SEC regular season title if they get a victory at Tennessee and Auburn loses to South Carolina. That's kind of where you're at there. But if Arkansas beats Tennessee, it's guaranteed no lower than a two seed in the SEC tournament. If Arkansas loses to Tennessee, it could it could finish anywhere from second, third, or fourth. It kind of depends on the outcome of Auburn's game against South Carolina or, or Kentucky's game at Florida, which, which that won't be easy for them. But Arkansas does have the tiebreaker at the moment over all three of those teams. So uh, exciting stuff. Great for them. Good on them to be in the position they are after the start that they had. This Tennessee game, though, it's going to be a tough one. I can already hear Rick Barnes throwing a fit about Jalen Williams and his charges. I joke about that. I, I just I still can't believe how big of a deal was made of that from the first game. I mean, he took four charges, not 40. He took three last night. I don't know how much Will Wade complained about it. And I get it. It wasn't necessarily about Jalen Williams as it is just the rule and, and how you call it and enforce it, whatever. Uh, make an adjustment. I mean, instruct your guys to jump stop in the lane and not go bowling into a 6'10 guy that you know is going to be there on the drive or when you dump it off. And, you know, we can sit here and argue all day about – you know, which one of those were charges and which were blocks, whatever. But that's a bang, bang play. Sometimes you're going to get it right, sometimes you're not. But you know it's coming, the attempt. If you're playing Arkansas, control what you can control, in my opinion. Anyway, I, I, I'm not crazy about the way this game sets up for Arkansas necessarily. I mean, it it's at Tennessee. It is their senior day. Uh, I mean, it's, and it's going to be the biggest, loudest road crowd Arkansas has seen. They they played in some good road environments. Uh, you think about going to Alabama, um, to Florida, places like that, uh, to LSU. So they played in some hostile envi environments. But Tennessee is going to be the biggest. This game has a lot on the line. Uh, they're doing a checkerboard thing, the orange and white checkerboard thing in the crowd. We'll see how that looks. It could be kind of cool. Uh, you know. They're undefeated at home this year. We know how difficult it is for a team to come in and, and beat Arkansas and Bud Walton. Uh, it's difficult to go win at Thompson Bowling Arena. They beat Arizona in there. They beat Kentucky in there. They beat Auburn in there. They're also pissed that Arkansas punked them in Fayetteville a couple weeks ago. I think Tennessee is definitely going to be the more well-rested team. I mean, they, they travel, but they played Georgia. 1-16 SEC Georgia on, on Tuesday. And, you know, Arkansas finished Wednesday's slugfest. It was a physical game against LSU. It was almost 11 o'clock. I mean, it was almost a three-hour game. And then they had the travel day and an 11 a.m. tip 
so an early tip on Saturday and it's not excuse making. I mean, it, it is what it is, but, um, I'm just saying the conditions are favorable for Tennessee to have a pretty good day. But to the credit of Eric Musselman in Arkansas, um, they really don't give a damn about all that. <laughs> I mean, this group just turns the page. They block out the noise. They don't make excuses and they're going to fight you for 40 minutes, no matter where you're at. So I think it's going to be a terrific game to wrap up the regular season. Uh, you know, you've got to be secure with the basketball and contain that backcourt of Tennessee's. Uh, Santiago Vescovi, Kennedy Chandler, uh, Zakai Ziegler, that's a really good tri uh, trio. Which, by the way, uh, shout out to Zakai, Zakai Ziegler. This is a freshman from New York. Uh, his family lost their home in a fire last week. And, I mean, that's... That's a tough situation, but uh, kudos to the University of Tennessee and, and everybody kind of working with him. They created a GoFundMe account to help them through that process. I think they set the goal at like $50,000, and it was over 100000 within like an hour. So um, I just think that's really cool, the outpouring of support. Uh, I posted on our, our message board, and you know, I had a few people reach out to me and say, hey, that, that, that's pretty cool. I donated. Um, good on him, and, and so best wishes to him and his family. Uh, extremely talented player. Arkansas wants to beat him over <laughs> over the course of the weekend, right? But uh, good backcourt for Tennessee. They've got Josiah Jordan James. This is a, a former five star, uh, big body, six six two fifteen guy, who's really been heating up for him as of late on the wing. Uh, we know John Fulkerson. I mean, he he's going to be motivated in what appears to be him wrapping up his twelve year college career at home. Uh, and then they just have big body after big body that they throw at you. I mean, they've got three or four guys in that 6'10 plus range. Uh, physical group, you know, the last game was a grinder, uh, 58 to 48 in Fayetteville. I mean, I'd imagine neither team gets out of the low to mid 60s. And this one on Saturday, going to be fun. All right. Shifting gears a little bit, hey, it's March, people. March Madness. Let's go. A little bracketology time. You know, most of you have seen it or heard it by now. Nothing really made me happier than hearing Eric Musselman sound off on the net rankings after the win last night because there's parts of it that just don't make sense at this point in the season. I see it. You see it. Must sees it. It's just a little wonky. I mean, Arkansas wins at Florida. And they beat Kentucky last week, and they essentially didn't even move. And, you know, if this is one of the key criteria for the selection committee, um, how can we then turn around and be ticked off at, say, an AP voter who maybe didn't bump up the Hogs as high as we want them to be in the polls last week? Not that the AP poll matters, but I'm just saying my point is that people – including me, say, well, you know, the net is a factor, uh, but it's the humans who are making the decisions at the end of the day. That's true, but things like the net, you know, Ken Palm, all those other metrics, they create a perception, right? So that might be why there's been some reluctance by, you know, bracketologists, whatever, to move Arkansas up to what feels like a more deserving seed for a team with the resume uh, that Arkansas has and the way that they've played winning 14 out of 15 here over the last couple months, you're starting to see that narrative change a little bit. Arkansas has been getting a little bit of a bump, deservedly so. And I also think it, it should probably be noted, you know, that Arkansas isn't the only team in the country, right? I mean, once you get to a certain point in these rankings and a certain point in the season, it's hard to do a lot of jumping because a lot of other teams have put together terrific seasons as well. But still, there's there's parts of it that just don't make sense. And, you know, for example, last night, and like I, like I said earlier, it's going to sound like I'm crapping on LSU. I'm not. It, it's just the, the example that stands out, I think, the most to people. Um, you know, Arkansas beats LSU last night. They stay put in Kempom at number 19. LSU lost the game, but they moved up a spot to 17. Okay. Arkansas did actually move from 23 to 21 in the net. So a, a two-spot bump at this point in the season, that's not bad. LSU stayed put at number 16. Um, 
I think that's fair. I mean, I guess they sh- they don't necessarily need to be punished heavily for a one point loss at Bud Walton Arena, but I guess the explanation I'm looking for is how is LSU sitting at number sixteen in the net at this point in the year with Arkansas at number twenty one, a five spot difference. But I look at all these things side by side and I don't understand. I mean, Arkansas is twenty four and six overall. LSU is twenty and ten. Arkansas is thirteen and four in the SEC. LSU is eight and nine. It's a five game difference. Arkansas is nine and one in its last ten games. LSU is five and five. Arkansas is eleven and four against the first two quadrants. LSU is nine and nine. Arkansas has more quad one wins. Arkansas has the two losses to Hofstra and Vandy that, that we keep talking about. LSU also lost to Vanderbilt. They also lost to Ole Miss at home, who's essentially right beside Hofstra in the net rankings. And if we want to talk about strength of schedule, um, LSU beat Penn State and Georgia Tech in the non-conference. I mean, is that so much better than Kansas State and Cincinnati? And, and then Arkansas beat LSU twice. They beat them in Baton Rouge. They beat them in Fayetteville. And so it's not a knock on on LSU. Like I said, they're really good. They're absolutely an NCAA tournament team. And I understand there, there are algorithms and, and formulas involved, but how they're valued above Arkansas in some of these metrics right now, I just don't get it. It's almost as if, as if you know, Arkansas is not allowed inside the top 20. You lost to Hofstra, you're not allowed inside the top 20, which is not happening. Insert formula onto the Excel spreadsheet. I mean, it's crazy. I think a fly in the serum maybe with the net formula is is too much weight is placed on performance against bad teams and maybe not enough against the good. If you think about it, Arkansas's biggest jumps have come kind of in those eye test games. Like they beat up on Georgia, Missouri, Ole Miss. Uh, The hits were against Vandy and Hofstra. Maybe that explains why a team like Houston, who, again, I think they're good, uh, but they're ranked third in the net. They have one quad one victory. So why even have these quadrants if they don't matter? But the thing is, they they beat the crap out of everybody else that they're supposed to. Uh, So their efficiency numbers are higher, uh, and maybe that's why they get valued a little bit more. So maybe there needs to be some tweaks there. Maybe there's, I think they're trying to take into account the entire body of work. But teams evolve over the course of the year, right? So maybe there's a way uh, to put a little more emphasis on what have you done for me lately and how are you playing at the end of the year um, because that's the team you're going to get at March Madness. November and December, Arkansas is not going to be playing in the NCAA tournament. This version of Arkansas is. So, I don't know. It, it's interesting. You know, really the wins over uh, Auburn, Kentucky, Tennessee, and LSU at home barely move the needle. It, it, you'd almost It's almost equal or, or better off that you lose a close game to a good team on the road. Arkansas might lose at Tennessee on Saturday and move up. I don't know. It's it's crazy. I ran enough about this. I've been racking my brain about it for weeks. And I mean, it's kind of like the 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 ESPN, the FPI, the football power index that nobody can figure out. It's kind of like that. I just don't understand. But whatever. They'll make some adjustments at some point. And in all, and a lot of the other key metrics, Arkansas is so solid. They're fine. You know, seeding wise, I think last night's win uh, probably guarantees you no, no lower than a five seed in the NCAA tournament. I'm not saying that's where they're at right now, but I think no lower than that. Possibly a four. I, I mean, that's where Arkansas is trending right now is towards that four line. Lenardi has them as a top four seed. Um, Arkansas certainly shouldn't be punished. They lose a game at Tennessee where nobody's won all season. Uh, seems like that game couldn't hurt you, but could only help you if if you get a dub down there. Um, you know, you win that game, maybe you play your way up a line, and, and you start getting that conversation for a three. So I, I think you know, even if they were to drop this game, so long as they don't lose a head scratcher, you know, in the first game at in Tampa, whoever they wind up getting matched up with, um, you know you got to feel pretty decent about a four seed at worst a five. I think you want to get one of those top four seeds if you're Arkansas because the selection committee typically they'll give consideration to location 
like where they place teams for the top four seeds in different regions. Uh, so, I mean, that can mean the difference in uh, Fort Worth and Portland, Oregon, <laughs> as far as where Arkansas is playing. That's big for the crowd, right? So we'll see what happens. All right, let's get to some questions here. See what you guys got. Uh, got just a few from the Razor's Edge message board, then I'll hop over into the chat. Uh, Nof93 asked for my thoughts on our band trolling LSU last night. Man, I missed it. I, I've got to go back and check on this. I'm, I must have just missed it. I don't know if I was locked in on you know whatever I was writing or what, but I've, I've heard a number of people or saw a number of tweets and stuff about it. I just haven't seen it. So props to the band. If they did troll LSU, I just guess I wasn't paying attention. My bad. Togdor VT asks if I've heard any rumblings of whether Arkansas might make a run at a Jumpman sponsorship. Uh, Muss's connection with and promotion of Nike has been noteworthy. Uh, that's an interesting, interesting thought. I, I haven't really heard anything about it. I haven't thought about it or, or really asked about it, honestly. I mean, it, it would probably have to be a Hunter Yurchak decision, obviously. Not that Muss wouldn't have some pull in that regard. It's an interesting thought, especially with all those shoe designs they've been doing. Hogslop2011 asks, uh, will the refs give J. Will charge calls in the NCAA tournament? Not if Rick Barnes is officiating. But in all seriousness, I, I think so. I mean, March Madness, it, it, it does tend to be more physical. They let, they let them play a little bit more. Um, you know, so you see like, some hand checks, elbows, tussling around the basket, those, those kind of things go on call. But usually a block charge call draws a whistle, and, and J. Will does a really good job at selling those. Hogwild97 says, uh, when is Anthony Black going public? Uh, for those who are living under a rock, Anthony Black's the, the last five-star remaining uh, on the board in the 2022 class, six, seven point guard out of Duncanville in Texas. Uh, incredible player. Arkansas very much in the mix there. Uh, he hasn't announced an official date to my knowledge. It, I think the popular belief is it's, it's probably going to happen around the end of the month, maybe sometime close to that McDonald's all American game. Um, still a lot of back and forth on, on what that decision will be, depending on who you ask. Uh, I've heard recently that, that Oklahoma state and the G league have, have maybe faded a bit. Um, I, I know the, the folks at Gonzaga still feel pretty good about their chances. And listen, everything I hear on the Arkansas front right now is extremely, extremely positive. So, uh, I think they're in the best shape that they have been there and we'll see what happens over the course of the next few weeks, but it would be a, it would be a hell of a late addition, wouldn't it? SDF of Little Rock says, who do you think will be back next year from our current roster? And who are some bigs we can get? We can go get after giving up 22 offensive rebounds last night. Okay, so scheduled to return next year, you've got um, Devo, Jalen Williams, uh, KK, Jackson Robinson, uh, Kamani Johnson, Connor Vanover, and Chance Moore. Um, listen, I mean, I I don't think all those guys will return. And that's not, you know, some big insider nugget there. I mean, it's just the law of averages you know, with the way college basketball is right now. Uh, you'll probably have a couple guys hit the portal. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, you know, we'll see what Jalen Williams does with, with testing the draft waters and getting some feedback there. Um, so, you know, it, it's a little hard to say. Hey, I mean, J.D. Note and, and Aldis Tony, those guys have the option to return if they want. Must said those conversations are really going to happen at the end of the season. Um, I think there's a very real argument to be made for those guys to come back, especially with NIL being a factor now. Uh, but if Musselman gets the right feedback on them, you know, from, from his professional connections, he will encourage them to go pro. But there's still a body of work to complete. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest eyes and the most eyes are going to be on these guys as we get into postseason play. So what can they do for their stock between now and then? And then they'll have a decision to make at that point. But my goodness, I mean, hypothetically speaking, if, if you bring those two dudes back with who they've got coming in, uh, I mean, you're looking at a top five preseason team in Arkansas, and it's going to be ridiculous. 
And then as far as uh, to get to your other question, as far as bigs are concerned, I mean, we'll just have to see what the, the portal provides. There's not much there right now in terms of high school guys in the class of 22. Most of them are already signed, sealed, and delivered elsewhere. But I, I do think Arkansas absolutely needs to add some athletic length in the front court. I think that's a weakness of this team right now. Jalen Williams, Kamani Johnson, those guys are great, but they need some verticality um, at the rim, some long arms, some rim runners. I think that would kind of help elevate them to another level, uh, especially going into next season. Horatio Hogg asks where Arkansas stands with Chris Johnson and Brandon Garrison. Uh, good shape, still ways to go, uh, but but both high four star guys. You know, uh, Chris Johnson's a, a six five guard, high four star. Um, Garrison's a six nine forward out of Oklahoma. Both have been on campus for unofficials already, which is good. I'd imagine Arkansas uh, will do everything they can to get him back for officials in the spring. I mean, Garrison was supposed to be at the Kentucky game, but he had one of his high school games rescheduled because of the weather. Uh, earlier in the week. So, uh, listen, both those guys are definitely on the board. I, I like them both. I think they're both quality players for sure. Z Beeler one asked how I see Arkansas doing in the sec tournament. Yeah. I, I mean, I think Arkansas will do well, you know, they'll be well rested at that point. Uh, should have a, a fairly favorable matchup in the first game Friday. I mean, there's still a lot of seating to be decided, but, uh, I mean, listen, this team is something like 11 or 12 and 0 on the year with two days or less of prep time. Uh, and Arkansas knows how to win ugly. That translates on, you know, to a neutral floor tournament type setting. Watch these conference championship games. I mean, teams who are playing their third or fourth game in three or four days, they don't have any legs. It's usually not pretty basketball. And Arkansas thrives in winning not pretty basketball games. So, uh, yeah, I, I think they could fell where <laughs> fair well down there. Um, you wonder about depth a little bit on those back to back to backs. I mean, Arkansas has been playing six guys, uh, pretty heavy minutes. They can go eight deep. They could go deeper than that if they wanted to, but, uh, you know, might stretch some extra minutes out of guys like Kamani, uh, you know, maybe you lean on Trey Wade a little bit more in that starting lineup. Uh, get Chris likes, you know, a little bit more involved in some rotations uh, just to save some legs. I don't think they'll do that in the first game. They'll go all in to win each game. But, hey, you know, if, if, if you play your Friday night game and you got a bunch of guys playing 38 plus minutes, uh, then maybe you, you get some other guys involved on Saturday uh, to keep them fresh for the stretch run. All right, let's hop over to the chat, see what we got. Chase McPherson says, don't exactly know how we pulled that one out last night. One thing I will say is this team finds a way to win. Amen. I mean, like I said, I had to scrap my entire story basically and, and rewrite it because, it, I mean, it was just not shaping up well. <laughs> but they figured it out. And, you know, when they need to get stops, they got stops. When they needed to get a defensive rebound, they got a defensive rebound. When they need a bucket, they get a bucket. They, they just find a way. And, and, again, it doesn't have to always be pretty. Sometimes it's really ugly, but, you know, their their grit, the effort that they play with, um, I mean, there's a lot to be said for that. They're together. Uh, they play for each other. They're well coached. And, uh, and, you know, usually those things pay off for you. Andrew Sawyer says, how good is this team, Final Four, Elite Eight? Um, you, I mean, it really does depend on matchups when you get there. And it's not a cop-out answer. It's true. Um, you know, I, I think there are particular types of teams that could give Arkansas trouble. We talked about how they struggle sometimes with length. We've seen them struggle a bit with, you know, dominant or, or very talented big men in recent weeks. And so I think if you run into teams that have some of those things, uh, that have multiple shooters who can maybe spread the floor and, and challenge you in different ways, you know, that could be problematic, but uh, Arkansas has proven the ability to win in so many different ways that it's hard to bet against them. Uh, they're going to have a chance in any game that they play because of the way they defend. Uh, they can win grinders. They can outscore teams. Um, and, and they've got a, a bunch of different guys that can step up and get the job done for them. Um, 
I, I think this is absolutely a second weekend team, which means Sweet 16 the minimum. And then you got to see what happens once you get there. But uh, do I think you know this team can make the type of run that it made last year? I really do. Uh, I really do. I think you got a bona fide All American and JD Note. A lot of the teams that make deep runs have a guy like that. You've got a dominant big man in Jalen Williams. A lot of the teams that make deep runs have a guy like that. And you've got some complimentary pieces like Stanley Mude, wild card guys who can really get going. Devo, who has the experience, who's done it before in March. So there's a lot of ingredients there for this team to make a sizable run. Um, I'm so anxious to see how the bracket shakes out. I really am. Where are they seated? Where are they going? Who do they play? It's going to be a blast. All right. Let's see what we got here. Joseph Marquez says, one of the best games I've been to and I've seen many Woo Pig. Yeah. Yeah, that was a that was a, an intense game. It really was. A lot of back and forth. Chris Swanson says, talent and faith is unbeatable. That's true. These guys believe they're, they are rock solid when it comes to confidence. Uh, belief, determination, grit, all those all those words, right? All those descriptors, they've got them. John Oliver says, 11 a.m. tip in front of 22,000 fans Saturday will be the toughest game of the season. No doubt about it. And Tennessee's playing for, you know, a, a potential SEC championship as well. And we talked about how good they are in that building. It is going to be tough. Going to be tough. But you can't count Arkansas out. They're going to fight you. Dustin Hoofman says, I love Musselman's reactions to these big games. It really shows he's all in to being Razorback and understands how to make everyone feel included in the win. Yeah, he was getting after it <laughs> at the end there. It was funny. It was his first game without the sling. And he uh, he was definitely throwing that arm around as much as he could, you know, in, in celebration. And we asked him, you know, after the game, like, you didn't have the sling on. How you feeling? He was like, Felt great during the game. Not so great now. I'm gonna see the doctor after this. So we'll uh, we'll talk to him later this afternoon. We'll see how sore he is after that. But uh, yeah, I mean, his his passion, that kind of stuff is contagious. Teams usually take on the personality of their coach, uh, and I think you see that that the same fire in the team that you do in Mus. Zach Williams says, "I like number 20 coming in for Jay Will. He didn't back down. Yeah, Kamani Johnson ain't backing down from anybody." Um, he is going to put a body on you. He's going to play you physical, um, and he's good at mind games too. You know, he'll he'll talk to you a little bit. He's pretty crafty at when he can throw a hip or an elbow in there without getting caught. Um, he's one of those guys that that you probably really don't like if you're on the other team, but you love him if he's your teammate. Gary Dimmitt says, "Does Arkansas struggle to finish the first half?" Uh, it seems we struggle holding a lead before half, but just the opposite when it comes to finishing the second half. Uh, that has been the case numerous times this year. Yeah, I've seen that sometimes out of them. Uh, it's it's almost like at the end of games sometimes where they you know take the air out of the ball a little bit, play the possession game, milk some clock. Uh, you see that sometimes at the end of the first half. They may, maybe they get a little bit stagnant or a little careless offensively, and, and teams get on a little spurt on them. Uh, early in the season, it was coming out after halftime. Like the first five minutes of the second half was something that they really struggled with. Um, sometimes it's the last five minutes of the first half. So um, it's so tough for teams to play a full 40 minutes of, of really good basketball. And, you know, those guys always say it's it's a game of runs. Um, but, yeah, they have had some opportunities. That Kentucky game stands out to me where they had a pretty sizable lead. Um, I thought really let Kentucky grab some momentum they're right before halftime, and, and the next thing you know, they're down right after the break. Um, so, yeah, you know, a, a little more focus in the final minutes or the early minutes of halves could help them for sure. Jim Lowe says, what's the deal with Vanover? Why not insert him for a few minutes here and there uh, to at least cause some havoc? The, the problem with that last night was, you know, LSU, as much as they were rebounding, um, they were kind of causing problems by – their mobility and, and the ability of some of their bigger guys to play on the perimeter. So, uh, you know, they would go with Darius Days at the power forward and Tari Eason, who's really kind of a big guard, or definitely a, a perimeter-oriented guy playing the center. 
so that kind of puts you in a bind. You know, a lot of people ask why weren't Jalen and Kamani playing together because Arkansas needed to rebound. Well, if you put those two guys on Days and Eason, you really have some tough matchups defensively. Uh, and, and I think that contributed, like I said earlier, to, to maybe why Jalen fouled out of the game uh, because you, you have to respect a guy like Eason out on the perimeter. Well, if you come out there too far and he sees a big man on him, he's going to drive it on you. So um, I think that was some of that. And, and Vanover not being the most mobile guy in the world, I mean, you could camp him out in the lane and he could protect the rim, block some shots, but they needed someone who could get out there and defend on the perimeter as well. Landon Montgomery says, can we reach a three seed? I hate the four because you meet the one. Um, yeah, Arkansas absolutely can. I think if they beat Tennessee this weekend, they will be a three seed. Easier said than done, but they can get there for sure. And I know what you mean about playing the one seeds, but honestly, if you, if you look at college basketball this year, I mean, you'd probably rather play somebody else, but I mean – are there really any major juggernauts out there? I mean, you got teams like Auburn and, and Kentucky who are very much in the thick of things for a one seed. Arkansas beat them both. Um, you know, Gonzaga, I, I think they're really, really good. But they're beatable. Alabama beat them. You know, so I, I get what you're saying there, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think Arkansas matches up fairly well against anybody. John Dexter says, I love Jalen trying to take charges, but he gets himself in foul trouble sometimes. Might need him to dial back a bit on that in the SEC and especially the NCAA tournament. Um, yes and no. I feel you. That he's, I, I think he's got to be smart about it. Just like with JD, uh, hey, you know, come out of the gates, go hard, go ag aggressive, do your thing. But if JD picks up a, you know, a reach in foul in the first few minutes, then yeah, you got to dial it back a little bit, man, because you can't be picking up your second foul and, and sitting on the bench for 16 minutes of a half. And so I think it's the, th the same thing with Jalen Williams, you know, keep doing your thing, being aggressive. If you pick up an early one, all right, you know, be aware, dial it back a little bit. It doesn't mean don't play hard or, or play matador defense and just let guys buy you, but uh, you got to be a little bit more measured about when you take your chances. The same thing if you get into the second half and you pick up a third quickly or, or something like that. I got to be smart, and, and Jalen's such a high IQ guy uh, that I think he'll be he'll be fine in that regard. I don't know how many times. When's the last time he fouled out before last night? I don't remember. Zach Williams says got a bad feeling about Saturday. Yeah, it. We talked about it. I mean, this it's it's a favorable setup uh, for Tennessee. I mean, it is what it is, right? But. Um, We'll see how it goes. You, you you cannot bet against the Razorbacks at this point, but it's going to be tough. I, I would actually say if Arkansas goes on the road and, and beats Tennessee on Saturday, I think that would be their best win of the year, despite beating number one Auburn and, and Kentucky at home. John Dexter says, also, who would have thought Jalen Williams would be hated by all these SEC teams? They're always complaining about him drawing charges. Yeah, I mean, he's the nicest guy in the world. Big old smile. If they knew him, they wouldn't feel that way, but I probably wouldn't like playing against that dude either for a number of reasons. Jason Fazio says, Tennessee was surely taking notes on how to contain JD. Yeah, LSU did a pretty good job on him. I'll give him credit for that. Yancey Long says, I can't wait to see the changes that Must makes that will allow J.D. to be himself even when the other team tries to take him out of the game. Yeah, and then LSU's not the first team that's that's put a heavy focus on J.D. I mean, he's a guy that's at the very top of the scouting report um, for everybody. And, you know, he's he's faced some of the best defenders in the country. He's faced double teams. He's been face guarded before. Uh, but LSU did a really good job on him last night. Brandon Gordley says, how's the Ziegler GoFundMe page not against NCAA rules? Not saying it isn't great, but anyone can funnel money to his family through that. Yeah, well, I don't know, honestly, but um, 
it was uh, the University of Tennessee helped facilitate it and get that approval. So whatever they did to to make sure that it was you know by the book or whatever, um, they did that. I know what you're saying though. Nancy Long says, I'm sure we'll be punished accordingly if we lose Saturday. Well, as far as I see, you know, if, if LSU is any indicator, if Arkansas loses on Saturday, they should either move up or stay put. And if anything else happens, I'll just have to hop back on this podcast and complain about it. Aaron Anderson says, I heard someone yell to Will Wade to shut up while watching the game. <laughs> And he was he was getting after it. I mean, right away from the very the the tip to the end of the game. I mean, he was walking out onto the court. He was almost in the lane at certain times uh, across half court over by Muss and the bench. I mean, he, I can't believe he didn't get a tech honestly. And Muss is a demonstrative dude on the bench too. Like he's animated. He gets after the officials too. But man, Will Wade was going to a different level last night. Noel. Clark Miller says, is there any truth to the fact Khalil Ware has not signed yet with Oregon? He's signed at Oregon. Aaron Anderson said, oh, talking about watching on TV. <laughs> Todd Drake, what recruits were at the LSU game? There were no recruits at the LSU game. Um, Wednesday, late night. They, they've had their guys the last few weekends. Todd Drake asked, does Anthony Black ever comment on the Razorback games? Anthony Black's a, a quiet kid. Um, he's been through a lot over the course of the past year, not just through the recruitment process, but through this eligibility thing with Duncanville. Uh, they keep that recruitment really tight to the vest. He had a great visit. He enjoyed himself. Joey Moses says, if Arkansas wins Saturday and wins the SEC tournament, will they finally be ranked and seated above Auburn, Kentucky, and Tennessee? If not, then something's really messed up. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what, so they're 24 and 6 now. Uh, that would move them to 25. 20, they'd be, what, 28 and 6 at that point with like a dozen quad one wins. And, you would think, but who knows? <laughs> oh, man. It's funny. People get riled up about this stuff. Seating, bracketology, net rankings. And I do, too. It, it's crazy because, I mean, you watch a team do what Arkansas has done, and, and you just want a little respect put on the name, you know? But they're getting it. I mean, th this wasn't even an NCAA tournament team in early January, to be quite honest. And... Uh, they've worked their way all the way back up to, you know, the four line here. So I guess we can't complain too much. Who am I kidding? Yeah, we can. All right. I think that's going to pretty much wrap us up. Big game on Saturday now, 11 a.m. in Knoxville against Tennessee. Uh, again, Arkansas has a shot still. They're still alive for the SEC regular season crown. And then it's the conference tournament. The next time you'll hear from me, uh, it'll be a live reaction from Tampa. I'll be there for the SEC tournament. Uh, we'll have a video out after all those games. And then it's Selection Sunday and, and March Madness. I mean, it's here, people. March has arrived. It's the best time of the year for a college basketball fan. Enjoy it. Appreciate all the feedback, comments on the show today. Appreciate you guys, as always, for tuning in. Again, this has been Curtis Wilkerson with Hog Hoops Live. And we will talk to you next time.